Welcome to this new life. We're so glad you're watching with us again today. And uh, today I have a powerful word from the Bible to share with you. A word that is going to give us incredible enlightenment, uh, not about just this life, but also what's going to happen after this life is over. I'm going to share from the Gospel of Luke chapter 16, and we are going to read from verse 19 to 31. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who had laid as his gate, designed to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that, has, that he may dip uh, the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded through one rise from the dead. This is a very interesting narrative. This is not a parable. This is not a, a telling that Jesus told out of his imagination. Every scholar is more or less agreeing that, that this is something that really had taken place because Jesus said there was a certain man. There was a certain rich man, he said. Now, he didn't mention his name, uh, but it is for sure he's like he's referring to somebody that truly once had lived. And then Jesus continues and says, and there was a certain poor man named Lazarus. You know, in the other parables that Jesus was telling, he never gave people names. So we're pretty sure that this is a telling, this is a narrative that is from real life. That Jesus is here describing something that actually has happened and he's describing something that is taking place and how it works. Now there's five things I would like to give us attention to uh, today in this program from this narrative. Five facts from this narrative tells us. The first thing it learns us is that we have all been born, but we will also all die someday. We have all been given this life. You were born. You have a father. You have a mother somewhere. Maybe they are not here anymore. Maybe they have abandoned you. Maybe you are living together with them still. But one thing for sure is that you did not drop out of the blue. We were all born. We have all been given a life, a life to live. And it can be under different conditions. In this narrative, we read about two who is having two very different life. One was living a wealthy life, a rich man. And the other person had a poor life. I think Jesus picked these two examples just to show us the wide span, that we are all under the same conditions, that we have been given 
a life and that life might have different aspects to it. But we have all been given this, a life full of responsibilities, a life where we have a free will, a life where we have to make choices, a life that can bring good and bad, a life that can be tough or a life that might be rough. But we have all been given a life to live. But one thing is also certain, and that is that we are all someday going to die. This life will have an end. This is no matter of our social status, no matter of our gender, if you are young, old, rich, poor, man or woman, good or bad, have had an easy, rich life full of blessings and goodness, or you have had a really rough and tough life with a lot of troubles like this poor man that even had sores all over and could not even get help. For certain, one thing will happen to all of us someday. We will all die. Life will have its end. There's a book in the Bible called Ecclesiastes. In chapter 8, verse 8, we read this. No one has power over the spirit to retain the spirit. And no one has power in the day of death. There's no release from that war. And wickedness will not deliver those who are given to it. He says, that we will all be living under the same conditions. The conditions is this, that we have a certain number of years, a certain number of days on this planet where we will live, and then it will take an end. And you see, this is important because this relates to all of us. No matter how different lives we might live, on the bottom line, we all started the same way. We were born as infants and we will all end the same way that this life on earth is coming to and close. The second thing we learn from this narrative is this, that there is an eternity. In other terms, that there is something that is going to continue when life here on earth is coming to a close. The continuation is not that we will be reborn again uh, on this planet, maybe as another person or as an animal or something. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that, yes, we have been given eternity in our hearts, but this is not the same as we will be reborn again as something else. Death, in other terms, is not the end. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, we read this, that God has put eternity in their hearts. Do you know you are created in such a way that, that in your heart, in your spirit, there is an eternity there? Yeah, you were born someday. That's where you came into existence and we will die physically someday. But in your inner man, there's an eternity that will continue to live on. You are created to live eternally. Maybe you say, oh, but I don't believe in this. But the thing is just this, that this is neither you and I that define this. It's not like if we believe in it, then it will be in existence. But if we don't believe in this, then it will not be in existence. No, this is something God has created. That's how we were designed. So it's not you and I believe that is making eternity exist or not. It is not us that will define what's going to happen after we die. It is made by God. The third thing this 
lesson teaches is that eternity can end up in two destinations. It's like there are two eternal destinations where we as a mankind can end up in. We read about Lazarus. It says that he woke up. Angels, when he died, angels came and brought him to the bosom of Abraham. Now, what does this mean? Well, it's actually just another expression, a way of saying paradise. So Lazarus woke up, was brought, when he passed away, he was brought by angels to paradise. Angels took care of him. So that was one destination. Jesus is making this um, uh, confirmed uh, when he was hanging on the cross and he was being crucified. Right and left of him, there were two thieves. These thieves, they realized that they were crucified for a reason. One thief just re uh, rejected and mocked Jesus, but the other thieves came to common sense and he said, I am here because I deserve it. You are not. And then he says to Jesus, please, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said something very interesting to this thief. He said, today you will go with me to paradise. So Jesus is confirming that there is this eternal place existing called paradise. Now paradise is where the presence of God is, where angels is coming. There is the, the, the presence, the fragrance of heaven there in paradise. There'll be peace. There'll be joy. There'll be no tears. There'll be no sickness. What's broken will be made whole again. I'm sure that we all realize that paradise is an absolutely amazing place. Wherever I have been sharing the gospel around the world, I've asked this, this question. No matter if I'm sharing this to atheists or uh, Hindus or uh, Muslims or whatever religion people is represented there, I ask them, how do you imagine paradise? They all describe it as the Bible describes it, as a unique, peaceful place where God is, or the love of God, or the peace, or the presence of God will be there. Lazarus came to paradise. But it also tells how there was another place where, where the rich man ended up. It says that he woke up in the absolutely contrary place to paradise. The Bible calls it Hades. Should we also call it hell just to describe, you know, uh, how that place is? The rich man described it, and in this narrative, it was described as a place of torment. All through the Word of God, we read how, how Hades is a horrible place, full of darkness, a demonic place, a place full of hate, darkness, loneliness, torment, fire, a horrible place, a place no one wants to be. Also, the response or reaction of the rich man describes a lot to us. When he realized somehow he had totally missed this and ended up in the wrong place, he said, oh, can I somehow shift over to paradise instead of, I will do whatever it takes if I can just end up in paradise instead of. But then it was described that that was not possible. So we see these is two separated places. So this is where eternity is. There's not like there is the paradise which is the place of, of light, and then there is Hades, which is the place of darkness. 
And then we can make up a place called gray. That's kind of a neutral place where there's nothing. No, such a place does not exist. There is only two options. It's like when we die and we stepped into eternity, it's like we have come to a T-cross, not an intersection where we can continue out, you know, just in neutral, but we have come to a T-cross where it's either going to be right or left. The Bible tells us that this is the two options for eternity. In this narrative, it was described like that. The fourth thing this story tells us is that our eternal destination is defined while we live here on earth. There's a great scripture in Hebrews chapter 9 we're going to read now. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. This makes clear to us that we will live once. We will also die once. It's not like after that we can start to make up our mind. It's not like we come and, and then we will have a few moments or some time after death to kind of decide, okay, so where would we like to go? No, that's not how it works. The Bible makes it clear that we have this li life we live now, both to live it, but it's also like a preparation. This is the time we have been given to make decision on where is it we want to spend eternity. The rich man truly regretted deeply that all his focus here in life has been on making himself wealth in pleasures of this life. And make it, let me just make this clear. The rich man did not go to Hades because he was rich. Not at all like Lazarus did not come to heaven or paradise because he was poor. That has nothing to do with that. But the rich man was so caught up in this life that it seems like he has spent not one single thought about what is going to happen after this life. All his attention was upon what can this life offer me? I think this is a trap that we can easily fall into. Most people, wherever they are, can get so caught up in life that they forget to think what will happen next. Maybe caught up in making money like this rich man, or caught up in interest and pleasures, hobbies, caught up in just being self-sufficient or being pleased in self, in all areas of life. But we need to be aware that this is the time here on life where we both can enjoy this life that we have been given and the Word of God encourage us to do so. But also we need to live a life being aware that this is not just 50 or 70 or 80 or 90 years we live here and that will be the end, but there's something we need to decide here on this earth. That is, what about eternity? You see, Lazarus had not had a lot of options or opportunity in life. He was poor, he was sick, he had limited uh, possibilities, limited choices here in life, but for some reason or another, he had been aware of the spiritual world. That's why he ended up, when he died, that angels came and brought him to Abraham's bosom, to paradise. This life is the life where we are going to decide what's going to happen to us on the other side. You see, this is not like 
dice is being thrown and when you, you when you die okay it was an even number so you go to paradise or it was an uneven number so you go to Hades no we have influence in those choices we are making where we are going to spend eternity we're not like puppets that God is controlling and you go there and and you go there no we have been giving our free will free will to worship free will to seek God free will to decide this is what this lesson is teaching us that we must remember in this life to make the right decisions for eternity the fifth lesson we are going to learn is that there is a salvation plan God has laid out. The entire Bible is full of this. We did read in Hebrew chapter 9 verse 27 how it has been given to each man or woman by the way also, but to each person to live and die once. But then listen what the Bible tells us in Hebrew chapter 9 verse 28, where it says this. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. So yes, we are programmed that we will die someday, but God has provided a plan of salvation. God truly wants you to end up in paradise. He don't want you to end up in Hades, but the decision is given to us, whether we will take one direction here in life or another. But God sent his son Jesus in order to prepare that we will have an opportunity to choose him as our savior. This was what this scripture told us, that God has sent Christ and that Christ, he was an atonement for our sins. All the things that has disqualified us to go to paradise. Jesus has come and made up a way, made a, a road for us, that we can choose that road that is Jesus Christ for him to be our savior. Isn't that wonderful? That God in heaven who loves us so much, he has already prepared that we can decide Jesus to be our savior and that is gonna bring us to paradise. Jesus is like a rescue line that has been thrown from heaven down on this earth. If you imagine yourself, you're out on a lake and you're shipwrecked, or you are on the ocean and you're shipwrecked, and you cannot swim, you need help. And then somebody throws a rescue line to you. But you must do something. You must grab a hold on that rescue line in order for that rescue line to help you and be effective to save you. Jesus was sent from heaven to this earth in order for bringing heaven to this earth and earth back to heaven. So that we will have this rescue line where Jesus is going to be our savior. We don't end up in co by coincidence in paradise. We don't end up in co by coincidence in Hades is a decision we have made. The Bible says if we believe in our heart Jesus to be the Son of God, and if we confess with our mouth, then we shall be saved. In other terms, this means we need a personal relationship to make Jesus our personal Savior, to ask him to forgive ourselves, to grab Jesus as our rescue line. We cannot in our own goodness save ourselves. We cannot in religious deeds save ourselves. No money 
is going to pay our way into paradise. We need a savior. I would like to pray a prayer together with you who wants to make this decision. There will believe in your heart that Jesus truly is the one that the Bible describes him as the savior sent from God. If we pray this prayer and believe, we will be saved. If you want to make this decision, put your hand upon your heart right now. Close your eyes and then pray this prayer in your own language. This same prayer I'm praying now. Jesus Christ, I believe you're the son of God. Forgive my sins. Save my soul. I will follow you. I will worship you every day the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now it is important that you keep yourself close to Jesus every day the rest of your life. Let me quickly give you three advices that will help you in doing so. Number one, pray to Jesus every day. Don't pray to any other name. Pray in the name of Jesus. Start your prayer by in the name of Jesus and end your prayer with thanksgiving and say in the name of Jesus, amen. You can pray to Jesus at any time, at any position, at any place. Number two, when we read in the Bible, we get more understanding about Jesus and the salvation Jesus has given to us. Maybe you don't have a Bible, but then I'm sure you have a smartphone or maybe access to a computer. Do you know that you can download for free the entire Bible in your language? And then you have the Bible. Make it a daily thing that you read a little bit in the Bible every day, maybe starting out in the Gospel of Luke. And thirdly, you need to have fellowship with others who is also following and worshiping Jesus as a Savior. Maybe you know of such a fellowship in your neighborhood or in your area. Why don't you ask if you can be part of that fellowship as well? Or maybe you say, I don't know of any such a fellowship in my area. Then you can always have fellowship through these programs. There's many great programs being broadcast on this channel. In this way, you can worship together with others. And also we will invite you to contact our call center. The information is below in the screen. Make sure to contact them. Tell them your need or prayer request and about the decision you have just made during this program. Thank you for watching this new life. May God bless you. May he be with you. See you next week.